Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's History's Lunch program in the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium. I am Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. If you have not already, please silence your cell phones. Uh, a few things coming up that we want you to know about. Tomorrow at 5 o'clock at Theodore Welty House and Garden, Cold Mountain author Charles Frazier will speak and sign copies of his new book, Verena, which explores the chaos of the Civil War through the eyes of Natchez native Verena Ann Banks Howell Davis, the second wife of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. That program is co-sponsored by Lemuria Books. It's free. begins tomorrow at 5 o'clock at the Welty House. And then I hope that we'll see you all back here next week when Ellen Meacham will be our History's Lunch Speaker. She'll discuss her new University Press of Mississippi book, Delta Epiphany, Robert F. Kennedy in Mississippi. Today, though, we are delighted to have Stan Galicki and Daryl Schmitz with us to talk about their new book, Roadside Geology of Mississippi. Stan Galicki has 33 years of experience as a geologist, 24 as a professor at Millsaps College. He worked in petroleum exploration prior to taking on academic responsibilities, and his primary research fields include sedimentary depositional environments, wetland biogeochemistry, and dendrochronology. Never let it be said I shirk from a challenge. Galicki is a registered professional geologist and member of the Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists and the Geological Society of America. Daryl Schmitz has 35 years of experience as a geologist and has spent the last 25 as a professor at Mississippi State University. A fellow of the Geological Society of America, Schmitz's experience is primarily with the development and protection of water and fossil fuel resources. He is past president of the National Association of State Boards of Geology and the Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists. Help me welcome Stan Galicki and Daryl Schmitz. Thank you for that. I think my clip came off, so they put it back on. There we go. All right, well, appreciate that. <clears throat> my part of the presentation, I'm going first to sort of describe what went into making of the book. And so with that, we'll move on forward. It started many years ago, and uh, there were several tasks to, to completing it, one of which was the uh, uh, identifying the roads that we were going to look at, the travel those roads, make road logs so we'd know what, where the geology was changing, and then also uh, compiling the text for the book, of course, editing it, and then finally it's published out. So the first thing we had to do is identify the roads and what regions, because the book, you typically break it into certain chunks, so to speak, rather than the, whole, the state as a whole. So to do that, we looked at the different roads, made some cri various criteria, and selected those some roads as well as uh, the regions. The criteria we looked at in selecting the roads, or all federal roads were to be included, which includes uh, the Natchez Trace because it's a federal road, uh, interstate roads, U.S. highways, primary state roads is a designation that the publisher likes to see, and uh, those change actually over, t over some time, and other state roads. Uh, we pretty much decided the other state roads would include uh, a few of the scenic roads that are around the state that come off of some of the other major roads and uh, also uh, roads that connected any of our cities that were about 10,000 in population or, or larger, uh, thinking that that would be reasonably well-traveled roads and so we wanted to include those. So this was the first cut at the roads we actually utilized in uh, doing the roadside geology for Mississippi. And you can sort of get a feel for that, and it's a sort of a, you know, cuts the state up pretty decently into uh, the different roadways that we're, we're look, we looked at to make the book. <clears throat> then the other portion was to get what regions we were going to break the state into. And so to get those regions we looked at, uh, particularly the geology and the physiography of the state, and we wanted it to about four. That's for our size state. There again, something the publisher liked, and so we kind of looked at what, how we could break the state into about four regions. And by looking at the geologic map of the state and this particular physiographic map, we ended up saying, well, there's, there's similar geology in here, and there's some similar here. Coast is a little different, and the bluffs and the floodplains are different, so we kind of used that to break it. 
which as you can sort of tell by looking, those lines correspond with the geology in that the physiography is controlled by the geology. So we broke it up that way initially. This is not the same physiographic map that is actually in the book because in that, uh, it's a, one of the books in year one has a few different newer terminologies, but when we started this process, this was one that I had long, long term up at Mississippi State and the easiest one for me to grab and mark on as you can see there. Well, so the next thing to do is travel the roads. <clears throat> and so all those roads you saw on the map a while ago, had to go drive every one of them and try to determine where the geology units were changing. And I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware how we have just outcrops of geology rock exposed everywhere in this state, right? Not so much so. Well, so what we did was look at other things too as we were traveling the road. Uh, we used main, a lot of existing literature to help us out maps that already existed, geolo geologic maps that existed, uh, uh, geologic survey bulletins, things like that. But then we also had to say, well, we're traveling over gently rolling terrain, or we're traveling through hilly terrain, or there's a uh, proliferation of cedar trees on this particular unit, and things like that to help distinguish the geology since you can't normally see it very well. These are some of the <coughs> examples of the road logs that were done. I started out actually with this book and thought that would be enough. As you can see, I went to another one that I happened to have handy. It was actually an older one. And then I had to buy some on the fly when I ran out of it, actually driving the roads. And as you can see, uh, my chicken scratch notes there uh, had to then be turned around, interpreted, and brought in to the book at a later date. And so uh, I note photos when I take them. I notice, note what geology I was traveling across and that type thing. And uh, to keep track of that, this is the map I used, one of the state road maps, and I would go along and hatcher the roads as I traveled them. And then as I started writing up the actual road itself, I would come along and highlight that road telling me that I had written it up. Because you can really get confused with what you're doing if you don't track it somehow, and that actually worked pretty well. Another map that was really helpful was the Mississippi Atlas and Gazetteer, if I said that right. Close, maybe. And it had some real useful information in it as well. In terms of uh, geology, we had the geologic map of the state put out by the State Survey, Office of Geology it is today. And uh, the original map uh, didn't have roadways on it, but uh, having been an employee of the survey many years ago, I got one of the copies of the overlays of the roads, which I was able to put on one of the state maps. I bind it, clipped it to it, and that stayed in my home office for years as I was doing this as a, a main guide to get an idea of what I was to expect when I was driving the road, those roads. We didn't, of course, cover all the roads that are on that, and some of those roads changed uh, over time, particularly with some of the four lanes. Uh, I should back up just a second here. <coughs> Inside from the geology and noting where that changes, in some way try to describe it in the book, also we wanted to take photos of any exposures or anything else of interest that might be a geologically uh, there and some of those areas of interest are not just because of geology itself has also has some historical significance Okay, here are just some examples of the existing literature that I used to help d define that geology as I was driving across it There again uh, state survey in the office of geology bulletins maps uh, The Corps of Engineers has done tremendous mapping in what we call the Delta the Mississippi River floodplain and uh, we utilize all of that to help put together the geology in the book and making those road logs also, of course. Exposures and photos. <clears throat> Some of you may be familiar with the real rocks that actually outcrop when you drive to Meridian. The, the MDOT's taken some of those out in recent years and sloped it back more, but there's still some over there. And any place like this that was about two foot of sand, so to speak, that was the geologic unit, not just the soil, then I took pictures of that. I think I end up with like 450 pictures of our paltry exposures around the state because there's no real good hard rocks, rarely at least. And uh, that ended up, I knew it would be cut down, edited down, but I wanted to take whatever I found and then have to edit it back, which we did. I think we're down to about 150 or something like that, yeah, actually in the book. Other, other areas of interest can be various things. I, I've traveled to almost all the water parks, state parks, uh, federal park you'll see in a second and to look is, is there something geologic of interest at these particular parks or, or sometimes other things 
And so I want to bring a couple of those in, talk a little bit about what we found there, and then I'll move into uh, a little bit of detail on some of them that's not actually in the book. But for example, up at Mississippi State, we have a museum dedicated to geology, the Dunsiler Museum. And so it's n noted that it's there in the Roadside Geology book, and so you can go take a look if you would like. And there are some other places like that along, along the state. Uh, there's a Clark Creek Natural Area of Trails, and it's a little ways off of a main road, as you can see here, but it's actually fairly well known by a lot of people that like hiking, particularly in that part of the country. And it's because of that, we included it as an area of interest, and it has some geologic control on it. It has something like, I think, 30 to 50 different waterfalls, if you can get to all of them or spend the time walking it. And this is some waterfalls, someone from scale, that's a pretty good sized waterfall from Mississippi. And there are a few other ones scattered around of significance too, but there's several in this area. So we included it because of its significance and interest. Another one's military park at Vicksburg. And this one I want to spend a little bit of more time on because uh, we've, in our professional meetings, we've had periodically some field trips and, and over there to look at the geology and how it had an effect on the siege of Vicksburg. And so because of that, uh, I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. And I will also state, I didn't do the original research on what I'm gonna to say to you. I picked it up secondhand from field trip leaders. And some of you may know better than I do, so feel free to correct me if I say something wrong. But at the military park, with the Vic city of Vicksburg and its defenses were something like this, with the old river uh, being its west boundary. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> In the book, we talk a little bit about some things that are going on there briefly. And here's a cross section of Mississippi River up to Vicksburg Bluff. And the very top of that is lust material. It's windblown material that settles out of the air. And because of that, it has a unique nature that it likes to erode almost vertically. And that's a big reason that we have those bluffs there at Vicksburg, as well as down Natchez and going on up to Memphis. Uh, it's not at the river as we go through the delta, but they're still there, just east of Greenwood, for example. So, Siege of Vicksburg. Many of you are sure familiar with the basics of that, but I wanted to put a map up to, to describe some of the things that would involve the geology related to the Siege of Vicksburg. Grant, of course, was trying to get past Vicksburg, and the river in the day came up and back down in front of Vicksburg, not like it does today. And I'll show you another map of detail later, which is why it made it such a gauntlet, so to speak, to try to get down, down the river at that point. So Grant did several things that actually the geology kind of dictated what he ended up doing. And I'll come back to all those in a minute. I will point out that the red lines are Confederate lines and the blue, the Union and the Union's uh, movement getting to the siege, including some of the battles, which I'll bring in and talk about a minute too. <clears throat> so the Lurst material on top of the valley wall made these unique bluffs. These unique bluffs made a great viewpoint. This is where the old river used to be, which is where the, right at the port of Vicksburg today. You can see it from Signal Hill over there in Vicksburg, overlook in the park. And old, old downtown Vicksburg was on the Mississippi River at the time. Now it's on the Yazoo that has come into the old Mississippi River's channel. So during the Civil War, did this number pass Vicksburg, and that's why it was such a gauntlet to try to get past Vicksburg, not like it is today. <clears throat> of course, one thing that uh, Grant wanted to try to do was cut that old meander off. He had engineering background out of West Point, and he knew if he could dig a canal, he could divert the Mississippi River off of that loop and leave Vicksburg stranded, so to speak, and wouldn't have to deal with them to get by them, so to speak. However, it turns, and that, that he did try, he did excavate a canal, okay? And you can see remains of that just across the river. There's some little park and some signs where you can see Grant's Canal, what's left of it's still over there. But he also knew that this angle that they constructed it hydrologically was not the right angle because the right angle would have put the outlet right at a Confederate cannon battery. And that's not, doesn't do you any good to cut off the meander and then come out at the cannon. So he tried a different angle, hoping it would work it didn't. Uh, after the Civil War, a flood period, nature actually went ahead and cut that meander off. Okay. Found an older map that looked kind of neat. <clears throat> you also notice that you got this kind of tortuous movement down through here. Well, two things. Grant did end up 
running the gauntlet. I think everybody's familiar with that. I think he had five boats and they only caught the fifth one because everybody was so, so surprised. And, and I do know I saw in writing where one of his own generals said, this is a mistake, this can't work, you know, to try to run by uh, and surprise, but it did, except for one boat. However, he still had his ground troops he needed to get south. And so this is the route of his ground troops, like this. And the reason it's like that is because they followed the natural levee of the Mississippi River. Any river, when it floods, when it's normally flowing, it's something like this. When it comes up and gets out on the floodplain because during flood periods, the water is carrying sediment. And the minute the water comes up and exits the floodplain, it loses velocity and drops the sediment right adjacent to the river, building up sediment, awfully, often sand materials, into what's called the natural levee. This is not a man-made thing. This is nature. If you're ever out in the wild walking around and walk up to a creek that hasn't been modified, you usually walk up a little bit in elevation right up to the bank. That's what this thing is, is natural levees. Well, Grant used the natural levee of the Mississippi River to march his ground troops down. That's why that route was so winding and twisty. He had to build bridges occasionally to cross streams that were coming in to the Mississippi, but he used the natural levee to march his troops down south. So he ran the gauntlet. It was reason, reason that gauntlet was there is geologic, geologic in nature. The way he could march his troops south was because of the natural levee of the Mississippi River, geologic in nature. Then it came ashore and, and there was the Battle of Port Gibson. <clears throat> and I wanted to show you, I think, yeah, this is a map I found. And some of these maps, the main reason I put them up here is to show you some relative numbers or relative, uh, I say numbers, but there's a lot of blue lines in here and not too many red lines. Okay, so when Grant got over there, he met a much inferior Confederate force and had trouble with them, okay? And some of my colleagues will claim that the inferior force almost defeated him. Well, nevertheless, he had trouble with them. So he ended up camping there uh, for a couple of days and sent scouting parties towards Jackson and towards Vicksburg. <clears throat> and so what had happened, he had come ashore, he was in that highly hilly, eroded, bluff, valley terrain there at Port Gibson, like it is at Vicksburg and whatnot, encountered those Confederate forces that he had trouble with. They were mainly rifles. He had a lot of cannon warfare to fight with. Cannons don't shoot up and down really easy and move them around, right? Whereas a rifle you can do that pretty easily with. So that's the reason the Confederates gave him trouble. They were rifles, mainly. Well, when he sent his troops or his scouting parties this way and this way, the report came back, well, this terrain coming into Vicksburg is very much like what we just had some difficulty in. And he didn't know, but Pemberton apparently had secret orders from Jeff Davis to, to protect Vicksburg at all costs, and he interpreted that to mean not leave Vicksburg. But Grant didn't know that, so he felt like if he marched towards Vicksburg, Pemberton would come out with a big force and much bigger than they'd already encountered, and it could be problematic. So he decided to go to Jackson. And in doing so, he encountered some other forces which he ended up defeating. And the story goes that a couple of those were ordered to meet and form a larger unit to encounter him. And the first general got there, a Confederate general said, ah, I can take on Grant myself, and got defeated, which left the other unit also in inferior, and Grant defeated them as well. Of course, took Jackson, and cut him off, and came back to Vicksburg. And, and there's a reason, reason a siege was necessary. These are some of the other uh, embattlements along the way. And what's the terrain like going once you get out of Vicksburg coming towards Jackson? Pretty gently rolling, isn't it? Coming through Edwards, only into Jackson. Much better for cannon warfare. So it makes sense that it was better suited for that terrain, to, to battle in that terrain. Here's an old map of Vicksburg, and the reason I want to put it up here, it shows kind of the topography. A lot of tall ridges and very incised valleys, steep walls on those valleys. And so Vicksburg is being protected in this realm, and in that time it was all kind of open. And this is actually over on the Union side of the park, looking across some of those ravines to the Confederate side. So when the Union tr first got there, when Grant first got there, they did a try a frontal attack, but... They were having to come down and up these ridges that weren't just open. They had sticks and pointy sticks and logs down in there and stuff like that. So Union troops would have to run up the hill, run down the hill, try to get across those things and run up a hill again. That didn't work. So they came back. And then the other thing about these ravines 
is they're, they're mostly, the hills are mostly parallel to the river, but there are a few connecting ridges, but there's only about 10 or 12 of those, and they're very narrow. So, and another ridge around the outer edge. So what ended up happening was that uh, the Confederates were fortified here, the Union troops under Grant came in the next ridge and was attacking from that ridge and trying to get across this. Now where there were connectors, they tried coming down those too, but that didn't work well either because you're in a relatively narrow line coming down and you're being shot at from quite a wide span, expanse on the other side. And each one of those ridges where they come across, the Confederates had built earthen forts. Here's an example of one of the uh, ravines with the things in it. These two shots came from a depiction in the museum over at uh, Vicksburg. It's really nicely done. Confederates used the lurse material I told you about that fell out of the air, okay, to make earthen type forts everywhere one of those roads was crossing into Vicksburg from the other ravine. And so that was an, an issue in terms of materials thick, it's earth material. And so after a couple of attempts, Grant decided, well, we, we can trench. There again, he had an engineering background. If he didn't already know, he determined pretty quickly that you can dig in that lurse material. It'll stay vertical. The walls won't collapse. The caves people stayed in Vicksburg during the war, they dug holes into that lurse. They weren't true caves. Okay? So he began tunneling. One of the first attempts was to tunnel into the bottom of those earthen forts. To, to try, that didn't work too well. But the Confederates figured out what they were doing and started setting off explosives in the bottom of the forts, which made that lurse material resort itself to where if you tried to tunnel under it, it would collapse on you. So it kind of stopped that effort. And so then Grant what ended up doing was having tunnels that were deep, but go into these different fortifications, several lines of them, and some of those are still open, still visible over there. In fact, you can still see some entrenchments and whatnot, because that lurse material will stay where it's at pretty well if you don't disturb it. And so he ended up trenching up to the Confederate lines, ready to send a bunch of folks down a bunch of these trenches to invade at that point. Of course, by that point, the Confederates had pretty much run out of supplies and ended up surrendering. Okay. So the geology had a big control on Vicksburg as a gauntlet. The earth lurse material that the Confederates used to make their fortifications out of, the fact it would stand up vertically so they could trench in it. And then of course the terrain, nature trenches in it too and makes real tall hills and ravines and that created a reason why Grant even went this whole route and had to siege. Okay. And today, another little interesting thing at the park, there's a lot of monuments from various states over there. And a lot of the rocks that are used are from native from the states that built the monuments. So you can see native rocks from other states in, in a lot of those monuments. Another short, quick one. Uh, we included Jefferson College in this when we originally wrote it because it was the first institution of higher learning in the old Southwest. There's a book by that title. And uh, so, and it had geology. There was a museum with samples, fossil and mineral rock samples. And so we put it in there and the publisher wanted out because it said we, there's, we want something to, they can see, to get out you know, and see. And I said, oh, well, okay. Aside from this historical significance, as far as geology is concerned, uh, Wales was one of the first geologists. He was educated there, he came back and was, I think, president there, certainly on the board there for a while. Well, they located the college, Jefferson College where it's at because of a natural spring and it was used really by the college till it closed. And I said, so in the Nature Trail, you can see that spring, and that's significant. And also, you can go to the uh, creek, St. Catherine Creek, and actually get in the creek and look at geologic stuff. So with those two pieces, they left a little piece in there about Jefferson College. Okay, compile the text. First cut at the cover and no numbers on table of contents. Uh, the introductory material, which uh, Stan Glicky did that part completely which includes cross-sections, how the islands have changed historically since they were first mapped off the coast, lots of other good things. And then we put in different regions for the roads as they were covered. Uh, and this is again a first cut of uh, Northeast Mississippi Interstate 20 going to Meridian, sort of a, a look off the tall hill going into Meridian, so those rocks and the cross-section there again, Stan Glicky did that cross-section. 
And then edits. Those are always the fun parts. Some people use the really modern stuff. I go in and highlight what I did, so here's what I did. Okay. And then proofs. And the proofs, the difference is you get the proof, you have to write on it. That's how you do the proofs to make the final edits and cuts. And then it gets published out. So that's kind of the making of it, the story of the making of it and a little bit of the history of some of the areas. One of the other areas I didn't include in the presentation that's close to me is uh, Plymouth Bluff over there, uh, close to Columbus. And originally when the Tin Tom was built, it was intended that that area of Plymouth Bluff would be flooded by the dam. But because it's historically significant where some of the first fossils ever recorded in this part of the country when it was settled were from that bluff, they redesigned and moved that lock and dam just north of it to preserve that bluff. So with that, uh, so with my part, and I'll turn it on to Stan. Stan. We certainly appreciate everybody attending today. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. I think tomorrow is going to be a little bit different. Um, so, Daryl, I can't thank Daryl enough for the initial work he did on this text, and then you know helping me edit and follow up on this. But <clears throat> this actually did not make the book, and some of you might know where this is. Uh, this is actually an old photograph, 1931, of the Mississippi Petrified Forest, and. Um, I couldn't get, National Geographic could not find the print. I had a copy of it out of the magazine, but um, they couldn't give me permission, and it ended up not going in the book. But uh, just a, an amazing photograph. If you've been to the museum now, you can tell that it's, it looks nothing like that now. Um, so in the, the roadside geology of Mississippi, you can see um, 271 pages, 63 road logs, 82 figures, 115 photos, and 42 sidebars. Um, I'll show you a little bit of, of what the book looks like. You can see the, the main sections of the book. Here is what a typical map looks like. Uh, each section is divided up into many maps. Uh, basically, the, the editors help us decide how large an area we can do. But you will see areas that have uh, the red dots, are what we call those sidebars or special interests, and there is a, a little bit of information about those. They, they, you know, one of the problems in doing a roadside geology book of Mississippi is that the geology has to be visible from the road. Well, as David Dockery will tell you, the best geology in Mississippi is not visible from the road. Um, and so we had to, some of these things had to be included because they are either historically significant or uh, were really unique, uh, portrayed the geology of Mississippi uh, in, a, in a unique way. This is just another, this is the map uh, from the coast. And again, you can see um, a couple sidebars here, the Stennis Space Center. Um, and, and we tried to incorporate as many of those as we could. Um, geologists are historians. Uh, James Hutton, in the, the late 1700s, coined, coined a term called uniformitarianism. And essentially, uh, over the years, that has been modified a little bit because Hutton had no way of knowing that the Earth's chemistry had changed, that plate tectonics uh, was out there, and rates and things like that changed. But essentially, what we use is the present is the key to the past. What we can observe happening today, for the most part, has happened in the past. And so that's what we use when we start writing these books uh, to figure out what's happened in Mississippi. Well, the red bars here are the rocks that are exposed at the surface in Mississippi. So you can see all of geologic time and little Mississippi has this right here. Well, that's what we had to work with. And so uh, we started with an introduction in the text and we started talking about the state. Uh, this is the final geological map uh, that shows up in the textbook. Uh, as you can see, uh, you know, Daryl talked about it a little bit, but uh, we think it turned out, we're pretty happy with the way it turned out. Um, had to work with some colors. There are certain guidelines that you're supposed to use from the USGS, and, and we had to make a few exceptions, but we tried as much as possible to follow those. We included a little bit of technology. Uh, this is a, a digital elevation model of Mississippi. You can see the, how dissected the state is. Um, 
with all the, the, the stream networks. And so the darker areas here are lower elevations. You can see the coast almost down to sea level or at sea level. Uh, how low the Mississippi River alluvial plain is and then uh, superimposed on top of that, I put the physiographic provinces. So in the, the kind of ad for this, we say that Mississippi has been slammed together and pulled apart, and, and that's very true. Um, the first supercontinent, uh, there have been as many as five, according to, to some of the researchers, but it had a name called Rodinia, and it was in existence from about 800 to 750 million years ago. Um, Rodinia was replaced by Pinotia. So the continents are rifted apart, and then after several million years, they will eventually come back together. So Pinotia was a continent, a very short-lived continent, you see about 60 million years, um, and it pulled apart about 540 million years ago. And you can see uh, this would be North America, um, that's South America, there's Africa, Australia, and so just kind of give you an idea of what the configuration of the continents was then. Uh, finally, uh, I didn't change that, Pangea, that's, a, that's an error, Pangea was the last one that pulled apart about 200 million years ago, and you can see that Mississippi um, would be sitting right here, there's South America, there's Africa, Florida, of course, was not there, the Yucatan Peninsula uh, was not yet there. Um, well, several, about a year ago, I was out grilling some pork chops and does that look, <laughs> this is totally coincidental, does that look familiar? Um, that is pork chop Pangea. And so <laughs> my, students, my students enjoy that. Um, I was always f trying to find a place to use it, and here it is today for the first time. Um, but even though we don't have the rocks at the surface, if you look at the subsurface of Mississippi, the scars are there. Um, we have... Uh, the ancient um, Ouachita front, uh, we have uh, thrust faults, evidence of when the, the, the state was crushed and, and put together. We have um, the buried Appalachian uh, tectonic front that comes in uh, through Alabama uh, in this part of the state. And we have various flexures and, and folds and, and interesting things like that, that that are part of the state. And again, these were worked into the introduction. Uh, this is a, uh, an adaptation, uh, Barbara's, in the, uh, Barbara's in the audience here, she sent me the digitized version that the state had, and then I had to take that and redraw it and configure it for the book, but this is a cross-section of Mississippi that runs from the north part of the state down to the south. Um, I didn't show it, but the control, how we know these formations are there, are based on oil wells and the interpretation of the data that's collected from oil wells. Um, I didn't want to do that yet. Um, uh, but what you can see is that this, this uh, kind of salmon colored and purple area, these are the oldest rocks in the state that only outcrop or are exposed here in the northeast corner of the state. But uh, these, were, these were 600 million years and, and younger uh, that were caught up um, when South America and Africa, uh, or Africa and South America collided with North America. And then, on top of that, the rocks that you see here, this is the, the Luan Salt, this is the Richton Salt Dome. Uh, this was deposited 200 million years ago as the Gulf of Mexico started to open up. Uh, and again, this is not something that you would see at the surface. Uh, we see very little at the surface. Um, sorry about that. One of the interesting things, since I mentioned a salt dome, many people don't know that uh, some nuclear tests were done in Mississippi back in the 1960s. In the Tatum Salt Dome, uh, Project uh, Dribble and Project Salmon and Sterling, they actually detonated two devices. The first one opened up a hole in the salt, and the second one was detonated inside there. And they were basically, the Department of Energy was looking at, at what the signals would look like uh, during, during this era of a, of a nuclear blast and, and actually got some data on how the salt behaves uh, when that happens. So this is uh, one of the figures uh, in the book. 
Um, I said that Mississippi had been rifted apart. This was back when Rodinia tore apart. Uh, this, this fault here would be similar to what the San Andreas is like today. Uh, uh, the west side, uh, LA and San Francisco are sliding past the rest of California. We had that same thing in Mississippi, but most interesting is this Mississippi Valley Graben that formed here. Um, many of us are familiar with foundation cracks and things like that. That was a crack in the foundation of North America. And, and so that continued throughout time, and what we see now is that that weak zone is where the Mississippi River uh, flows out towards the Gulf of Mexico. The rocks take a pronounced um, kind of a fold here. Uh, you can see some Cretaceous rocks here. They actually go around up near Cairo, Illinois, and then back down through Arkansas. Um, that is there that's called the Mississippi Embayment, and it's there because of that weak zone. Um, what you've got on top is a north-south cross-section that runs here, and then this cross-section A runs, runs east-west. And you can see this bowl-shaped configuration as the sediments drop down into that weak zone um, over time. And, and so the Mississippi River flows where it does because of something that happened 600 million years ago. Hello? Yes? Uh, group and formation, those are just names that we give to uh, different groups of rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this, this book is written, there are many things in the introduction that we have to explain. And so we do give you a basic kind of a, a primer to geology if you're not familiar. What is a, what is a formation? What is a syncline? What is, uh, you know, what is a fault? Uh, we talk about that uh, because this book is written um, for again, the, the, the public to enjoy as they traverse the roads. Um, we put some different snapshots of, of what Mississippi and the surrounding states would have looked like at that time. Sorry, wrong button. Um, and so this would have been during the late Mississippian time. You can see that uh, South America was just beginning to come in and collide with what would become North America. So Mississippi was kind of right at the crossroads here. Uh, one of the, the, the features of that, um, further to the north, there were some barrier islands. This is up at uh, Tishomingo State Park. Uh, this is the Hartzell Sandstone, which is a barrier island. And it, it, it sits on top of a, a more shale-like deposit. But this is one of the older deposits that we have in the state. And so if you look at the size and the shape and the composition of the sand, um, you can get an idea um, it looks very much like a barrier island today, and so we interpret that as a barrier island. Of course, the uh, Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway uh, was dug through this area, and it was one of the, still remains one of the largest uh, engineered construction features on Earth. Uh, the uh, people had dreamed, some of the first explorers that came through this area said, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could get from Tennessee down to the Gulf? But you couldn't do it until they built the canal, and so, Again, this is one of the sidebars. It talks about how that dam was built, but the Hartzell Sandstone is one of the units that they had to, uh, of course, blast through. If we go a little further, um, many people don't know that, that there was a mountain range between Jackson and Memphis that probably rivaled the Himalayas. That had to be formed and that had to be eroded away. Uh, before anything else could be deposited in Mississippi. So this is the Pennsylvanian time. We have um, uh, many of those rocks, the first ones that I showed you, were, are now buried under thousands of feet of sediment. Um, we don't see those, but these interpretations were made from research that's been done by numerous individuals. Um, one that, that I particularly like, and many people hear about, is the Jackson Dome and the chalks that we have in Mississippi. Well, those were deposited during the Upper Cretaceous. So here is where the Jackson Dome would have been. There's the Midnight Volcano up in um, hum, uh, Issaquina County? Where's Humphreys. Humphreys, yeah. And then, of course, the Monroe Uplift. Those were volcanic domes. They were features that were possibly associated with a um, 
Um, very hot temperatures, uh, what we call perhaps a mantle plume or hot spot moving beneath Mississippi. But during this time, we also had the deposition of chalk. And if you've ever been up near Starkville, you've seen the white rocks that, that, that are exposed in that area. This is chalk. This is the same material that forms the cliffs of Dover in England. They were deposited at the same time. The, the oceans were full of coccolithophorids, uh, little algae that made their shells, and when those things died, they accumulate um, and create a chalk. Uh, if you ever find an outcrop, it's very easy to find fossils. You can find pyrite, um, and, and we talk about things like that. Here's what the Jackson Dome looks like. Uh, this was modified after a petroleum geologist in town, Steve Walkinshaw, but beneath Jackson, uh, actually, it's about two miles in diameter, about 2,500 feet or so beneath uh, the Colosseum. Uh, you can, there are igneous rocks down there. And uh, so uh, that's how we have interpreted the dome, but uh, these exploration geologists that have drilled wells, they can tell that it came up through these older rocks. It, it pierced up through them. And so uh, there are you know, hundreds of maps that have been done on these formations and how they were affected by this came through. Um, we do see surface evidence of the, uh, of the Jackson Dome, and it's mostly in our geologic map where uh, the Yazoo clay and, and some younger formations take a big circle around Jackson, uh, the outcrop pattern does. Um, then we move into the Paleocene, and basically Mississippi turned into a sand pile, uh, sediment was eroding from the continent, brought down by an ancestral Mississippi River. Um, we were, uh, not only do we have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the silts and, and sands that are deposited uh, on the way to Meridian, but more recently, uh, this is a shot of the Red Hills lignite mine. And so Mississippi does produce lignite. Uh, this was deposited kind of in a coastal environment uh, where you had a lot of organic matter, a lot of trees that were dying and being buried very quickly. Um, and we can actually use this to produce energy. So this is in Kemper County. Um, a pretty amazing operation. Uh, if you ever have the chance to go there, you can actually get a field trip. And we talk about that in the book. Uh, if you call ahead of time, uh, you might be able to get a field trip. One of the uh, especially pertinent to Jackson it was a deposition of the Yazoo clay. Um, this ocean that goes all the way up into mid-Tennessee um, was one of the last big transgressions. It's the last time the ocean was present on much of North America. This, this Mississippi embayment was kind of the last gasp. Um, all the younger formations after this, the, the water kind of pulled back and is where we see it today. But what was deposited then is the Yazoo clay, and of course we get um, our state fossil, which is very prevalent um, in the Yazoo clay, and we also get this. <laughs> Most people are familiar with this. Um, the Yazoo clay does shrink and swell uh, with exposure uh, to water, or exposure to water and then dehydration, so we have foundation problems. So it's given us some good, it's given us some bad. The Pleistocene, uh, that's the Ice Ages. And so um, what many people don't realize is that during the Ice Ages, I'll go back, sea level dropped about 400 feet during the last Ice Age. When that happens, the Mississippi River cuts its channel down and tries to get to the ocean in a big hurry. And so that created the Mississippi River uh, it caused it to downcut its channel, um, and, and so we end up with, um, at that time, the coastline was probably 100 miles offshore, uh, 80 to 100 miles offshore, because all the water was in the ice sheets. Uh, the maximum, what we call the glacial maximum uh, during the Wisconsin, uh, again, about 420 feet below sea level, and then you can see what's happened since then and sea level is, is continuing to rise right now. Um, so as a, as a result of that, um, we now in this area 
Uh, as the Mississippi down cut, it created a valley. When the water level came back up, that whole channel system filled up with sand and gravel. And so all the aquaculture, um, all the catfish, um, all of the, uh, the, the corn, the soybeans, and the cotton and that are grown in the delta take water from that Mississippi alluvial plain aquifer. So again, that geology uh, is very important, not to mention the presence of the Mississippi River itself in creating the soils in that area that make it so fertile. We're doing okay. Um, anybody that's ever driven through the Delta um, has noticed uh, the channels, but you may not know that there was a period of time when the Mississippi, about 10,000 years ago, flowed very close to the bluff line. There was a period of time when it came right down the center of what we call the Delta. And then now, of course, it's in this channel right through here. Um, but, but these have all been mapped. Uh, people have studied them and, again, made these interpretations. So we've been able to present this uh, map to you in, uh, in Roadside Geology of Mississippi. Um, of course, Daryl talked about the Lurse Bluffs. They, prevent, they propose uh, engineering problems. These are soil nails in, the, uh, in one of the casinos uh, in Vicksburg. Uh, anybody that's ever been to Natchez has seen Clifton Avenue. Um, as I said, history repeats itself. Uh, this will fail someday. Uh, it has failed before. Uh, that's a good 100 to 200 foot bluff, so I'm not sure I would want to live on Clifton Avenue. But uh, uh, there is actually a report, uh, and someone said it happened once, it will happen again, and, and they are correct. Uh, here's a, a Lurse uh, bluff. Uh, they excavated this when they put the road through, and then, of course, you can't talk about Mississippi without talking about kudzu. And so that kudzu is helping stabilize that lurse. Uh, the Mississippi uh, uh, flood of 1927, uh, you can go to uh, uh, Mound Landing up in North Mississippi. There's a marker on the current levee uh, here. But the river back in 1927 was over here you can still see scars of all the water as it scoured out and flooded the delta. And of course, here's the range. The black is the range of the 1927 flood. And then you can see the range of the 2011 flood. Um, and much of that, the limited range of the 2011 flood was due to the extensive levee system that we've built since 1927. Uh, just to give you an idea, that was the 2011 flood in Vicksburg. That's the 1927 marker. This is down on Front Street. You can see these. That's where the flood waters would have been in 1927 had the levee not broken. So Vicksburg would have experienced a lot more flooding. We've got wonderful uh, oxbow lakes and, and uh, cypress swamps. Uh, that is um, um, Sky Lake in Humphreys County, Mississippi. We've got wonderful man-made beaches. Uh, I say wonderful, they have to be maintained. Uh, many, many people around the world are learning that when you create a beach or to protect the continent, uh, the, the coastal areas, you have to nourish those beaches with sand, and that's a very expensive proposition. So we're trying to learn, and we talk about it in the book, we're trying to learn how to manage these beaches without the expensive uh, nourishment that has to happen. Finally, uh, again, we have to talk about hurricanes in Mississippi. Um, this record still stands. Uh, it's the high water basin mark for the Atlantic hurricane basin. And this was at the uh, Beau Rivage Lighthouse. Uh, during Katrina, you had a storm surge of 22 feet, which is not the highest. Uh, past Christiane had a storm surge of about 27 feet. But you combine an 11 foot tide and a one-foot wave height, and you end up with a 34-foot uh, watermark here uh, at Beau Rivage. And that has since been rebuilt, but, but again, that, that record stands. Um, and finally, thank you. This is probably my favorite shot uh, that shows up in the book, and that's Red Bluff uh, in Columbia, Mississippi. But those colors are real. If you haven't been there, it's worth it. It's just a few steps off the road, um, and you can get some of the 
again, just beautiful colors like that. Uh, but on behalf of Daryl, we want to thank you. And Chris has a microphone, so if you have questions, Daryl and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. What happens to the state lines between Mississippi and Arkansas and Mississippi and Louisiana when the river shifts? Uh, my state geologist can help me here, but there was a time when we used to move them. But now I think those state boundaries stay fixed. Is that, you guys know, David? Okay, yeah. I, I believe the state boundaries are set. If the Mississippi River moves, they don't adjust. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? What makes the yellow in that shot? It's the, the iron that is in the, the, the water. So the iron oxidizes and gives us these, these various colors. There are purples here that, that may not show up. There's some purples up there, but purple, yellow, uh, reds. It's just, just beautiful, yeah. Uh, in that shot with the uh, Regina and the fault line that runs across Mississippi, uh -huh. uh, you didn't have county boundaries up there, but it looked like it may have passed through Madison and maybe Wayne County. And I was wondering if you thought all the earthquakes that we have in Wayne County and now we've had some recent ones in Madison, um, do you think it's related? There are, there are actually other, um, you're talking about the, the major fault that the, the Arkansas, Oklahoma transform. There are other fault zones, um, uh, the Clark County fault zone, that are associated with uh, different, different tectonic processes. Really the, the opening of the Gulf is, is what most of the seismic activity is in Clark County, or in, in Wayne out there. And then um, uh, in Madison, uh, there are some faults, but again, they're not, probably not associated um, with that. I'm going to speak for myself. You all have taken a very dry subject and made it very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. You can answer some of these? There's one back there, Chris. Is it Uh, it no doubt takes millions of years for these changes to be made. Are we watching anything today that's actually moving? Yeah, well, when you're talking, yeah, the, the Atlantic Ocean is opening up at about the rate your fingernails grow. Uh, the Pacific, the San Andreas Fault moves. It doesn't move every day, but, but you can track these with satellite imagery now. Uh, so the plates are actively moving. Some of the some of the fastest plate movement is in the South Pacific, and you're talking about sometimes upwards of 17 centimeters a year, which is, which is considerable. So, so yes, they, th this movement is, is being tracked. Um, it, well, you saw that that, that Graben, that, that feature actually wraps around, and so the New Madrid Fault was part of that rifting episode. And so, yeah, there's a weak zone there. Uh, it's actually called the Real Foot Rift. Um, one of my colleagues at Millsaps looks at near surface, uh, near surface features, but they record um, earthquakes as many as, as sometimes two or three a week, but they're only ones or twos. Um, in the New Madrid seismic zone. And what's happening now is it's, not, it's under compression now because North America is kind of being pushed to the, to the west, southwest, and so it's under compression. And so what's happening is that fault slips every once in a while. The last time it did, the major faults were 1811 and 1812. Uh, those were the big faults on the New Madrid. And so when you go to places like Memphis, uh, next time you drive through Memphis on I-55, look at all their bridges. They've got huge cables that connect the bridge to the bridge pilings to keep them from falling um, should the New Madrid rupture again. Everything we've done, uh, not, to, not to alarm you, but 
that entire area, I-55, all the refineries, everything on the Mississippi River, Memphis, all that has been, been built since 1811, 1812. So nothing has been tested by a big earthquake. I have a question for Daryl. Oh. Good. Okay. <laughs> uh, up at Mississippi State, uh, what, what building are y'all located in? You showed, uh, there was a picture of the Geological Museum. It's Hilburn Hall, H-I-L-B-U-N. Okay. That was an easy one. Yeah, I, I, I should have known that, but it's been a while. Uh, they're getting to be quite a lot of attractions up at Mississippi State with the different museums and all, so have to put that one on the next trip. Sure. Would you comment on the Chafalaya Mississippi River connection? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Mississippi would love to flow down the Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, somebody might be able to correct me, but I think approximately, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the Mississippi is actually diverted through uh, some floodgates there down the Atchafalaya. Uh, but the whole infrastructure south of there through Baton Rouge and New Orleans, um, we've got so much invested now that the Corps of Engineers has to keep that channel open. But the Mississippi would love to flow. Uh, periodically, over the past seven to 10,000 years, um, I don't think that made the book, but that Mississippi River Delta, uh, not the Delta up north of here, the real Delta shifts back and forth. And so now, it abandoned that Atchafalaya Basin uh, probably about 7,000 years ago, that whole area has settled. And so the Mississippi River would love to flow back, but of course we've channelized it and it has to, if we want to maintain that shipping route, then it's going to stay that way. Uh, but they, the old river structure um, down near Natchez or Port Gibson, you can go visit it. Uh, they have a video in 1975 during the big, big flood, that structure almost failed. Uh, they have a good video of it, I think, that you can still see. Uh, but they have since rebuilt that, and they manage very carefully the, the amount of water that goes through the Atchafalaya. Is that? Yeah. Okay. I, I picked up this book a few weeks ago. It is all kinds of fun to read through, and I have planned lots of day trips since picking it up. It is for sale at the Mississippi Museum store just outside the doors and right through here. And Stan and Daryl will be happy to sign a copy of it for you. Help me thank Dan and Stan and Daryl for this. 